Welcome to Coffee with a Journalist, a podcast featuring the tech industry's most well-known tech journalists. We uncover the real person behind the stories you love to read. We discuss their beat and news coverage, what their inbox looks like, and a whole lot more. I'm Jared Martin, the co-founder and chief operations officer at OnePitch. Our host for the show is Beck Bamberger, the co-founder of OnePitch, CEO of BAM Communications, and a current journalist. Today on the show, we have Alex Kantrowitz, senior tech reporter at BuzzFeed. He tells us more about his new book launch, his rare start in journalism, the new generation of journalists and newsrooms, and a lot more. Let's hear more today from Alex and Beck. Hey, everyone. Special guest today, not only a journalist, but also an author of the new book, Always Day One, recently out, available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, all your favorite bookstores. Alex Kantrowitz is a San Francisco-based senior tech reporter at BuzzFeed. He covers all the big tech world companies that we know so well, Google, Twitter, Facebook, and the like. And he's here today. Hi, Alex. Hello. Thank you for having me. We're excited you're here. First off, tell us about the book. How was that to write? Oh, it was great. It felt a lot like what we're doing now. I sat alone in my apartment for about a year and, uh, of course, went out and did some interviews. But uh, this is a very familiar feeling. So just to give a quick introduction to it, it's called Always Day One, How the Tech Titans Plan to Stay on Top Forever. Um, And it's a book that looks into the inner workings of Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft. And the idea was basically... I had, you know, as a reporter here in Silicon Valley, I had seen that the tech giants were operating in a way that was very different from every traditional company I had seen. Their culture, their leadership, their process, and even their internal technology was just unique. And I thought that it was one of the most underexplored areas um, when it came to coverage of the tech giants was to talk about how these inner workings are actually related to how successful they are. You know, typically you have a big company and they just sort of get clunky and bureaucratic, and then slowly but surely they fall apart. And these companies are massive, and they keep getting stronger. And so I wondered if there was something, a connection between how they operate on the inside and their ability to be so strong and continue to build. And that's uh, what the book goes into. And I'm sure you found there is some compelling thread through about how they do stay so aggressive and keep ballooning in the size that they are. Yeah, that's right. But I guess Um, you got to read the book. Yeah, you can read the book. We can talk about it throughout this conversation. Um, It's out now, so I got nothing to hide anymore. Finally, after a long time, I'm able to discuss it. Let's 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 drop some little tidbits then as we chat, so people can get a little two for one on not only how you like pitches, but also then how this book unfolds. First off, talking about just how you make a story, and this could apply to your book, but also just the articles that you write. How do you go about starting from square one? creating a good story that's going to be an article that's up on BuzzFeed or a book that's going to be a bestseller? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the key is to be speaking with people all the time. You know, anyone who's in this business and is shy is going to ultimately close themselves off for opportunities for good stories. Anyone who's in this business and isn't curious is going to close themselves off to opportunities for good stories. So since I've been doing this, and I started out actually working in sales and marketing before moving into journalism, Um, But since I've been doing this, I've just made a point to fill my days with interviews and conversations with people and just to, you know, prod a little bit, but also most importantly to listen and see what they think is interesting in the world. And then, you know, I think that what you can do is when you're in a position, it's actually a really cool job because when you're in a position to be doing that all day, every day, sometimes people will say things or act a certain way uh, that will cue you into the fact that, that there's something different going on that your readers might be interested in. And that's sort of where a story begins. Mm. And speaking of your background, you were marketing manager at New York City's Economic Development Corp. And you also have a degree from Cornell in industrial and labor relations. That's right. Yeah, I took a really circuitous path into (laughs) into this world. I I applied to Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations only because I knew that it would it focused on negotiation and conflict resolution, and there was no science or math requirement. And I thought that was kind of cool because <laughs> those are my weak subjects. Perfect. So I said, okay, let's do this. So, so I applied early decision. I didn't really know what I was getting into until in my first week there, like in one of my first days, um, they packed me and a bunch of other freshmen into a yellow school bus. We were up in upstate New York, and they drove us to a glass bottle factory. And these, uh, we were basically, it was this 
big, dark warehouse, obviously, with all the machinery there. And we just saw molten hot rods of liquid glass like flying above our heads and then getting hit with a puff of water and then turning into bottles. And they brought us into this break room and they talked to us about bathroom breaks and they had one of those, you know, 63 days without an injury signs. And I said, what the hell have I done here? I made a terrible mistake. But actually, um, over time, I, I think that, you know, if you start to focus on culture and how companies operate, you know, how they're managed, how people are incentivized, uh, you, you can start to really learn a little bit about uh, a lot more about how they work. Like I kind of think of it a little bit like um, there's a machine and then there's the outputs, you know. And so if you understand the, ma- the machine, you're going to do a much better job understanding why it's spitting out what it's spitting out. And I love how this goes back to the book you just wrote, funny enough. Did you ever <laughs> think about that tie through? I'm like, wow, there you are standing in the factory learning about labor relations in your undergrad. And I'm sure that is what's covered in your book is what's that magic sauce? What is the actual people of these companies doing that's so special that keeps propelling them to success? Oh, totally. You know, it's interesting when I'm in these companies in Silicon Valley, like I had a good idea of how how the traditional companies work. And then having this conversations, having these conversations with them uh, about how they they operate. Um, and they really don't do very much that sort of is what we were taught about. And so, yeah, it definitely piqued my curiosity enough to the point where I felt the book was necessary. And, and actually in the last chapter, I go back to Cornell and speak to the professors there and say, hey, you know, you taught us these different theories of, of workplace management. And what I'm seeing in Silicon Valley doesn't neatly fit in any of the boxes you presented. So what, So how is the workplace changing? And, and where do you think we're heading from here? So yeah, definitely. You know, I think there's this great Steve Jobs talk about that he gives at Stanford and he talks about connecting the dots. You know, how he took this mm-hmm. calligraphy class and then ended up being able to bring these beautiful fonts into the Mac. And I think this is like a true like connects the, connect the dots situation yes, where like I love that. Yeah, it didn't make much sense to me at the time, but now looking back, I'm like, "Oh, okay. Well, actually there was some value in, you know, following this thing that I was passionate about, learning a little bit more about it." And then it's mm-hmm. carried with me throughout the rest of my life. Hmm. Love how that works out. That's nice. What is in your inbox now that you're done writing this book or maybe previously while you were writing this book and you were off to do this so you weren't necessarily in like the pitch machine trying to get all your work done at BizFeed because you had time out or time off. What does your inbox typically look like with just pitches? Oh, yeah, it's a complete mess. Okay. It's really just a total mess. It, it's chaos. So uh, it's a struggle to keep on top of all the emails. But I guess, you know, for the for this audience's purposes. <laughs> oh, yes. No, we want to know. We want to know intimately. So do you save every pitch? Do you just delete everyone? Do you ever reference one back? What's your protocol? How do you do this? I have most PR agency emails uh, filter into a PR stuff folder. They skip my inbox and they, f- they filter into that folder. And so I'll, you know, instead of like having that sort of take my attention throughout the day all day long, like I'll go a couple times a day and just kind of take a, take a look through take a peek. what's in there. Yeah. Oh, so then that way it stays like contained. Exactly. It, yeah. So, so it's contained and I always feel like it's amazing how many PR agencies there are out there. Cause I feel like, okay, I've done a good job. I got them all. And then like, there's another seven that show up one morning and I'm like, where did these come from? So, um, so I, I do my best. Oh, wow. They just keep multiplying. Yeah. They, they keep multiplying. So I do my best to be diligent and put them into that PR stuff folder. And it's not that I ignore the folder. I definitely check it, but yeah, it's, it's less frequent. But what happens when you get one that files into it, but is actually not? Like, do any of them slip through to your regular inbox by chance? Yeah. I, I'm just wondering about you know, because people have weird domains. Yeah. So then when I get a new one in the regular inbox, I just, uh, usually if I see like three or four, I'll just go uh, make a filter, put the top level domain mm-hmm. and then just filter them into the, into the, into that folder. I mean, just to be completely honest, like when it comes to, when it comes to pitches from the comp, like people who are in house, mm-hmm. those will go directly into the inbox. So if it's at like at Facebook or FB.com or Twitter.com, those will be messages that will come straight in. Got you. Okay. And then do you, what happens the rest in that folder? Like, do you just keep it, the PR folder, you keep it indefinitely? Does it just get bigger and bigger? You ever delete them? 
You go back to them two months later. What happens? Yes, it grows. It grows and grows and it grows. Just grows. And, it's just yeah, it's because just, <laughs> this is the cool thing about Gmail, though, right? It's like you can go into Gmail and and search anything. So for me, there's really no utility in deleting these pitches. And trust me, there have been times where I've gone back to an email that I got three years ago, and I'm like, oh, okay, well now you know. Three years ago. I mean, three is is uh. Yeah, maybe five years ago. I don't know. That's the cool thing about Gmail is, you know, I think just having that contact in the inbox, you know, sometimes, oftentimes I'll be proactively reaching out after I've heard something. So, mm. so for me to delete those emails would be silly. And like, of course, like the fact Gmail search is amazing. Like Google's done a pretty good job with search. It's almost as if they knew something about it. So um, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, I, I think that that's super helpful. Oh, wow. Wow. I can't believe someone getting a pitch or response from a journalist five years later. But hey, everyone who's listening, that might be Alex writing back to you. Well, just to be realistic about it, I'm probably not going to say, hey, I'm now interested in your product news from 2015. It's more like I've heard this thing about your company. Can you please confirm or deny? Yeah, can you please? So, yeah, yeah. Just but to it be clear. beats not getting a call. So It's true. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. <laughs> Well, good to know. I've, I like that system. It seems quite efficient. So I get how that works. Mm-hmm. Good. Okay. So why don't we play a little word association game, which is one of my favorite things to do here. So I'm just going to give you a word. Yeah, this is the part I'm most scared of. Okay. Okay. <laughs> don't get scared. Yeah. We can edit no, anything that you like yeah. mess up on. Okay, let's no, go. No. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Fo- so here we go. Food. Uh, grocery store. <laughs> okay. Drink. Uh, well stocked right now. Hobby? Uh, running. I know this is not really word association, but I'm getting into the Peloton thing too. Like the Peloton app is oh, okay. free right now for 90 days. And um, I got like a fairly inexpensive uh, stationary bike from Amazon. I've just put the two together. And let oh. me tell you guys, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Pro tips on this show too. I love it. Okay, tech? Oh, uh, Tech. I would just say increasingly. So wait, now let's let's talk about the rules for this. So uh, <laughs> do I give you one word or I can just say whatever I want about it? Well, it's supposed to be like one word, but yeah. I'll accept two or three words. How about that? Uh, okay, okay. So, so hit me with the tech again. Okay, tech. Increasingly important. Okay, oh, good. Facebook. Redeeming but responsible. Facebook is redeeming itself, uh, but that doesn't excuse its past failures. All right. Twitter. A fun shit show. <laughs> Google. Uh, another. Uh, another shit show. Google. And it's, it can be a shit show for sure. I mean, valuable, but um, not without its problems. I, let's go with trying hard. Trying hard. Mm. Privacy. Privacy. Oh, man. Um, important. Mm-hmm. Security. Security overlooked. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, journalism. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a hard time right now. Probably harder than it's been in a long time. Ooh. Pitch. Well, I'll go with... Uh, <laughs> I'll get to it eventually. Okay. And then inbox. More than zero. More, more than zero. Yes. There you go. All right. That was good. I think I like mm-hmm. your Facebook answer the best. Thank you. <laughs> Well, they're, they're doing a good job with coronavirus, obviously, mm-hmm. but it's also like how responsible are they for the breakdown of trust in the media and in, yeah. in, in like truth yeah. that we're experiencing and then how, how much has that played into the response that we're seeing? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there've been all these stories about how Facebook is good and I agree. I mean, I don't think Facebook is a net negative, but, you know, I think we do still need to pay attention to the fact of that they've been, I mean, them and some news networks have been part of a unfortunate, you know, disillusion and trust in the media and increase in sensationalism. And we're paying a price for it. Yes, we are. And we're all in it together, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. It's true. Well, speaking of, speaking of <laughs> sensational news and whatever, what, what do you like to read? What's your typical reading step? Even like books, fiction, you got anything that you love? Yeah, I read BuzzFeed News. Uh, I read, I have a subscription to the New York Times and I read it pretty vociferously. I'll dip into the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg uh, throughout the day. Most of my news comes from Twitter, for better or, or worse. But, you know, it's no, there's no better place to go to find everything that's happening. 
you know, in one central stream and it's good. It's good in that way. And then just like I, you know, every night before I go to sleep, um, I pick up the Kindle and I'm reading either books I've taken out from the library or um, there's an extension where you can um, send articles and read them on the Kindle that way. So I use that and I, I tend to go to the New Yorker and longform.org and uh, send, you know, see what looks interesting and maybe send two and then pick it up. And, um, you know, I get about 100 words in and drift right off to sleep and uh, it does the trick. God bless the libraries. Isn't it great? Yeah, they're great. I think they're like coming back in a sense too. I think millennials are like embracing the, the beautiful place that they have in society more than ever. I hope so. You know, it's a shame that um, libraries have taken a back seat for a little bit. Um, they're very important institutions. I, I'm a big fan of them. Uh, obviously, you know, we need books. We need people to be interested in books. I think one thing that we can uh, do much better uh, as a country and a and a you know broader global population is read more of these things and and you know I think they teach critical thought and having written one um, I will say and I don't think that mine is necessarily an example of this but I will say that you know I read a bunch along and the amount of work that gets done before a book comes out is absolutely crazy and so you know when you pick one up you're just reading you know somebody who's an expert in the subject matter uh, that they're covering um, you're reading their best swing. And how awesome is that? It beats reading the news feed on Facebook, if you ask me. I mean, it's a little more difficult to get into, uh, but uh, there's a lot to be gained from it. So here's to books and here's to libraries. Yes. What do you think about the future of journalism? It's a great question. I mean, it's, this is a very tough moment. And, you know, there are lo- as a result of coronavirus, there are already local uh, newspapers that are laying people off. You know, I, I, I think journalism is already in dire straits. You know, thankfully, we we have, like, the Times has become stronger over the past few years as a result of subscriptions, and it's great. I mean, it's really like, you know, there's no denying that they do really great work, not without their own problems, but mm-hmm. the work is amazing. I mean, I think Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, BuzzFeed, like, these are all good news sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the thing that really concerns me, and this is not really a novel thought, but just to echo it, is that we've lost a lot of accountability reporting at the local level. And it's a shame because you end up with, you know, local supervisors and county executives and mayors and sheriffs that um, know that they don't need to worry too much about being held accountable by the press, which was something that is for a long time they had, they had, you know, they had to be concerned with. So they had to watch how they act. But what do you do if you know that there's no real worry uh, that some you know hard driving reporter will look into your actions and potentially hold them hold you to account for it, and the answer too often is that people just you know they act as if there are no consequences, and unfortunately in the in this country too often it really feels like there aren't any consequences. So um, yeah, so you know I I mean look is journalism responsible for all accountability everywhere? I wouldn't say that, but any town that I live in, I'd want a really healthy local press. Because ultimately, I'm paying taxes and I'm being protected by these people, and my life is in their hands. You know, right now, quite literally. And so, so that hard, that hard hitting local reporting is something that we need, and I wish we find a way to to help revive it. I know. Yeah, I wonder if it would ever be supported. Like I've, I've heard this idea touted about, but not from like a nonprofit standpoint, but as like a government funded piece, just like a library, frankly. You know, that's yeah. funded by taxpayers. And is that's that a route idea. that government... But now that's interesting because then, yeah. ooh, you know, you bite the mouth that feeds you in a way. Uh-huh. See, that that's... You have oh, to... Totally. Yeah, it gets uh, interesting to be like, well, how independent could they be? Yeah. I think that these... these And I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and um, spent time in local newsrooms. And I personally think, you know, not as a, an employee, but I've spoken with the people working there. And honestly, like the government, having the government fund these papers is fraught, as you mentioned. I, what I think would be great is if they, you know, there's going to be a new generation that's going to come in to lead them. And there are so many different business lines they can go into that are outside of the, you know, typical sell ads. I know, right? I mean, you have, you're trusted in the local community. You have their attention. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many. Okay, let me give you one example. Um, I was deciding whether or not to say this. To do it, do it. We're here. 
So Pittsburgh, right? There's uh, Pittsburgh had a large exodus. That city had a large exodus. Yes, it did. Um, and I went to school there for my MBA. Oh, where, which school were you in? University of Pittsburgh, Katz Business School. Yeah. Okay. So you know, you know the city, and you know why. And any city you go in on a Sunday, um, you know, in normal times, you'll see people walking around with Steelers jerseys. Oh, all the time there, all the time, like town's uniform. That's right. And that's because the Pittsburgh, you know, Pittsburgh residents have, you know, set up shop all across the U.S. So can't a newspaper um, find some way to communicate with these people? I mean, obviously, they're not going to get the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette to their street, to their doorstep every day, um, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're in San Diego. Mm -hmm. But let's say if you're a San Diego resident and you have this connection to Pittsburgh, what if you could sign up and spend $2, $3 to get a postcard once a month? Um, with a beautiful picture of the city on the front and some updates about the place that you grew up in on the back. So this is some one you know potential idea. And I have to say, like for these local news organizations, there are opportunities across the board to turn creative ideas into you know new and improved revenue streams. And so I'm I'm hopeful that that there's a that we'll get there. It's just a matter of finding the leaders who have the the interest in in doing things that are not like they've always been done. Well, and probably the innovation for it too, because it's not like the tech industry is like, oh, you know what needs disrupting? Journalism. You know, that's not the first thing on the list. Although I have to say BuzzFeed has done a great job in reinventing itself. And a lot of, to some extent, um, some of the big entities as well have pivoted, I think, well into the digital age and and all this good stuff. But yeah, it needs like a, a shock or just some more you know, techie innovation with like a Silicon Valley approach, if you ask me, which it sounds like what you're saying. And it's like basic stuff. It's not like it's, it needs to be like a robot delivers your news or anything. It needs to just be, what are the other streams that hold interest for the consumer, the reader, just like a, a Steelers fan who's like, oh my God, I would love to get that monthly mailer about my hometown that I love so much. I still wish I was there. You're like all that stuff. Yeah, and why not? So it's just there. There are these like the postcard idea, for instance, is just a simple and straightforward thing. I'm per- personally baffled that we haven't seen more of it. And by the way, this is and, and not to bring everything back to the book, but this is why I called the book always day one because literally you have to start operate. You have to look at each day, and this is what the tech giants do so well. They look at each day as if it's their first, without regard for their legacy. So you know, there's never a, a approach inside any of these companies except for maybe Apple where it's, this is just the way we do business around here. They're always looking at it as if they're a first day with, you know, uh, you know, unburdened from their legacy businesses. What would we do today if we didn't have to worry about our existing revenue streams? And unfortunately, newspapers haven't really done that. Um, but I do think there's a chance for them to pick that up and, and turn it around. And I, I'm hoping they do. Gosh, you had a very optimistic answer here. One of the few I hear, honestly. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I mean optimism is free. Um, and honestly, like we're resilient, like we have this ability to get kicked and then get back up and figure it out. And we've seen it happen over and over again. So I'm obviously distressed at what's going to happen to local news, but I'm also not discouraged. Let us stay positive. I bet some innovations around the corner here, hopefully. That's good. Well, now let us play Alex on a totally different topic, but still kind of related to all things journalism. A little Mad Lib. Did you ever play a Mad Lib growing up? Yeah, I have. We played it on the bus when I was a kid, and I was never very good at it. So, uh, well, <laughs> here we this go. This is your redeeming time. Let's try okay. it. Let's try it. Okay. Let's do it. So, I'll give you the list, and then I'll read back to you the wonderful paragraph that is going to unfold here. Often they are quite accurate, people say. So, let's see. Let's see how yours is uh-huh. going to be. Okay. Okay, great. Just a regular catchphrase. What, what kind of like catchphrase would you say? Uh, just do it. <laughs> is that a catchphrase? I don't know. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. okay. Journalist scare phrase. How about, uh, I'm calling your editor. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Empowering journalism buzzword. Reporting. Reporting. Okay. Okay. I like it. What about an adjective? Just any adjective? Yeah. Yeah. Small. Small. And then what about a part of a pitch? Subject line. Another adjective. Tiny. And then what about another part of a pitch? Call to action. Amount of time. 
Year. Another adjective. Dark. Singular noun. Uh, sky. And then what about a topic? And then we're almost done. Uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Good one. Then what about a verb that ends in ing? Uh, swimming. Then finally, just a verb. I don't know. Dunk. Okay, are you ready? I'm excited to hear what this is going to turn out into, yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go, here we go. To me, tech journalism is just do it. It consists of, I'm calling your editor and reporting on the daily. If a pitch is a small subject line, I will absolutely respond to it. However, if a pitch is a tiny call to action, you can expect no reply from me. If a year goes by and you don't see an email back from me, you can just assume I am not dark about it. The best stories always have sky and are usually about Donald Trump. And the best way to reach me is by swimming up to me, but you can also dunk me. (laughs) Uh, That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Right? Where do I sign up? I can email it to you. That'll be my new bio. Yes, perfect. Put it on your Twitter, which by the way, everyone follow Alex here, your f- Twitter following is what, 27,000 people or something ridiculous? You're no, definitely something like that. You're definitely <laughs> a name, Alex. My God. And now an author. Go buy the book, everybody. Yes, please buy the book. It's, uh, it's an interesting time to release one. So every sale really makes a difference. It is. It is. And funny enough, like how appropriate day one. Like it's just a good reminder. I mean, again, it's about reinvention. And this is a moment where we're going to need to reinvent in in a lot of ways. So uh, obviously not planned. But if you're thinking about what the future is going to look like, it could help. That's my pitch. Thank you, Alex, for being on. So appreciate you. And congrats on the book. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Coffee with the Journalist featuring Alex Kantrowitz from BuzzFeed. The goal of our show is to give you an in-depth look into the tech industry's most well-known and coveted journalists, and we hope you found today's episode insightful. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our show on iTunes, Spotify, and everywhere else you enjoy listening to podcasts. We'll see you next week with an all-new guest and even more insights. Until then, let's quit bitching about pitching and start great stories. 